Hello, I'm Cindy Ehrenberg Seltzer, President and CEO of the Children's Services Council of Broward County. Welcome to a special one-hour edition of Future First, Focus on Broward's Children. Over the years on this show, we have spoken about the effects of trauma, toxic stress, and adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, in the context of subjects such as institutionalized racial disparity, access to behavioral health services, and innovative approaches to both law enforcement and the judicial systems. One of the things that we've learned throughout is that trauma in one way or another affects everyone. It's impossible to go through life without experiencing it, whether because of personal suffering, witnessing an act of violence, or many other reasons. The tragic events of February 14, 2018, when an armed gunman entered a building at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and opened fire with an AR-15 assault rifle, killing 17 students and faculty and seriously wounding another 17, brought a traumatic event of a collective nature to our community. Our community has been on a journey of collective and individual healing ever since. A journey that has been encompassed by many things, including a commitment to reducing the effects of trauma through mind-body work. First, through a grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Broward County School Superintendent Robert Runcie and other senior staff brought the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and its founder, Dr. James Gordon, to Broward County for work focusing on the mind-body connection, the importance of self-care, and non-medical responses to trauma work that is currently being expanded in partnership with the Children's Services Council. During a recent training, we had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Gordon about the concept of mind-body medicine and how he came to frame this approach. Let's hear from him before I introduce today's guests. Uh, mind-body medicine is grounded in the understanding that everything that happens to us in our lives affects both our mind and body Everything that happens emotionally, every thought we have, affects every function in our body, and vice versa. There's a continual biochemical, physiological conversation that's going on among all parts of ourselves. And mind-body medicine is the way we enter into that conversation, and we are able to make changes that bring us back into balance and then enhance our functioning. What happens when we are under extreme stress of any kind is that it disrupts all the functions in our body. So it affects the way our nervous system works, it affects our digestive system. Uh, we're putting out high levels of stress hormones, which in turn decrease functioning in certain areas of the brain that are concerned with uh, awareness and judgment and compassion and increase functioning in areas concerned with fear and anger, sort of more primitive areas of the brain. So under stress, we get thrown out of balance. We move into what's called the fight or flight response, which is a natural response when we're having to deal with danger, either to fight and hopefully win the fight or run away. Now that's fine, that's there in all vertebrates. The problem is that in we humans, the fight or flight response continues long after it's necessary. So we stay in that state of hyper arousal and agitation and anxiety and difficulty sleeping and focusing for weeks, months, years. The other thing that happens is if the stress or trauma is overwhelming, for example, what happened in the kids at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and the trauma is both overwhelming and inescapable. Somebody's come with a gun, uh, it's terrifying, life is threatened, and you can't go anywhere. Then sometimes, in addition to fight or flight, uh, people, adults as well as children, go into a freeze response. The body kind of shuts down, and we become detached, and body becomes stiff, and uh, we feel disconnected from everybody. When I was a researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health in the early 1970s, I started looking at all these other ways that people had of understanding and helping themselves, like meditation and mental imagery and uh, yoga and tai chi. And, and I was starting to do those things and I was reading uh, the scientific literature and the research literature that showed that these approaches changed the way the brain worked, they changed the way people felt, uh, 
They didn't cost anything. They didn't have any negative side effects. So I began to think this needs to be part of what we do in medicine and healthcare and psychiatry and psychology. So that's how I began to develop this approach. I think it's really important, um, this is a, a point I always make, it's a, uh, is that trauma is universal. It's going to affect all of us sooner or later. If it doesn't affect us when we're young, as we get old, we're not as strong, we develop illnesses, we lose people we love, we face our own death. Trauma is a part of life. I've just finished a book, which is coming out soon, called The Transformation, Discovering Wholeness and Healing After Trauma. This is a universal experience, trauma, and a universal possibility. So that needs to be conveyed to everyone. You, you, you mentioned first responders, and of course they're, they're dealing with overwhelming trauma almost every day. And the culture, unfortunately, until recently, and even now, has been, no, you gotta suck it up, you gotta go ahead, don't pay attention to that, you're tough, you can, but nobody is that tough. And now firefighters and police have some of the highest levels not only of suicide, but also of chronic illness and depression. So we, we've got to make this understanding universal and make it universal in the people who are leaders in the community or leaders, you know, the police chiefs and the fire chiefs, so that they don't say, oh, you know, suck it up, go back in there, or what's the matter with you? You'll go see a shrink, get some pills. It's not like that. It's much more like, yeah, We've all gone through that. And what's crucial is that the response should not primarily be a medical response. You got a problem, you go see the shrink. It should be a public health response that everybody is going through difficult times, particularly after an event like the shootings of last February 14th. Everybody is affected and everybody needs to heal and everybody needs to both learn the to use the tools for healing and also come together. Some people may also need to see people, individual therapists, psychologists, psychotherapists, that's fine. But the whole community needs to be understood as, as having been traumatized and in need of healing. The work we're doing is moving forward through the kinds of training programs that we're doing. Here, it's primarily with adults. We have 10 students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas who are part of this training program, but the other 140 people are teachers, therapists, counselors, uh, parents who are actively involved in the community. We need to train a critical mass of people in this work of self-awareness, self-care, and group support, and to support them as they work with all members in all parts of Broward County. And this has to be a long-term commitment. This is not a quick fix. This is about training 180 people came last year to the training, 140 this year, 300, probably more like two or 3,000 people should over the years be trained who can share this work in different ways. But there's got to be a commitment, an ongoing commitment to serving the whole community. Without that, the trauma is going to persist. Uh, what we need to be created is a culture of healing and a culture of wellness as opposed to a culture, not even a culture, as opposed to a, 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 a reaction of avoidance or a reaction of blame. Th those are not going to help either one. It's a question of people coming together. And our work is to just help people learn these basic tools and to support them as they share it with others. And so what the teachers are doing in the schools, what the counselors are doing with the kids and the family members, and what the kids are doing with each other. We're training peer counselors, that's beautiful. We started at MSD, but I would love that to be in all schools that have peer counseling programs so they can learn these basic skills and share it with the other kids. The work that we do translates very easily across cultures. We have worked in many sort of low-income communities where there's a great deal of violence. I'm thinking Cité de Soleil in Haiti, maybe the most violent community in the world. And people welcome this, they get it. This is nothing to do, this is not an upper middle class white thing. This is, we're drawing on all the world's healing traditions. And my experience working here in the US, working in the Caribbean, working in Europe and the Middle East and Africa, 
people understand it, that the challenge, and really the challenge for the community, is to reach out and bring in those people who are ordinarily neglected or underserved and to make the kinds of things that we have and perhaps others have available to them, they will embrace it if they're encouraged and they're given the opportunity. Okay, now that we know what mind-body medicine is and how the Center for Mind-Body Medicine came to be, let me introduce today's guests. Linda richmeyer Sear, clinical psychologist and associate clinical director at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Ellen fox Snyder, licensed mental health counselor, a parent of a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School student and co-founder of the Mind-Body Ambassadors Club at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Arthi Suresh, President and co-founder of the Mind Body Ambassadors Club at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where she is a student, and Thaddeus Gamery, president of the Swims Foundation and founder of Mind Body Aquatics. Later, we'll also hear from Diane Wolk Rogers, a teacher at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and a co-founder of the Mind Body Ambassadors Club. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Linda, you've been doing this work a long time, and I've now had the honor and privilege oh. of working with you over the last year as you've led the work here in Broward. Can you please talk a little bit about how you came into this work and what you've been doing here in Broward? Sure. It's fun to go back and think about that. It was a, a colleague of mine, a nurse practitioner. I was working as a clinical psychologist in a behavioral pediatric clinic. Um, and I, it was really when you know, mind-body medicine was just kind of getting some traction in the, our fields of health and health care. And she had attended the training. She said, this is back in the days where they had pamphlets. She handed me the pamphlet and said, I think you would like this. I went to the training and it transformed really my practice as a psychologist. Uh, I was just starting out. Um, I, I really integrated things that I wanted to do um, and bring in. It really helped me understand a little bit of my development. When I was in high school, I had cancer. And one of the healing moments in that experience was learning imagery. So when I went to the hospital, my parents had me meet with the chaplain. And it was just a gentle experience of calming my nervous system. I didn't know that at the time, because it was just, what, what did I like to do? Where did I want to be? And um, I was a strong student in college, and just what I wanted to do after high school was really important. So I came to the training, you know, 12 years later, um, in my early 30s, and learning the science was so important, um, but it was the community. And went through the whole program, became certified in mind-body medicine, and then eventually joined the faculty. So You've done amazing work here. You've, you've been leading the training over the last yeah. year. And we so appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for all that. We're going to get into more okay. of that as we, okay. as we progress. Ellen, so you're a mom. You're a licensed clinician. And how did you come to the training and decide to co-found the Mind Body Ambassadors Club? Well, um, my daughter um, was there on February 14th during the shooting. Um, we were texting back and forth. Um, she was in hiding uh, in the media center. And I got a text saying, I love you and everyone. This is real. And that feeling of helplessness as a parent was, was overwhelming. Um, and once she was home, we were a lucky family because she did come home that day. Um, I said, I have to do something. I have to do something to help. And this opportunity came along. Um, and I said, let me go see what this is all about. And it really was life changing for me and set me on a, uh, a path to help my community. And it's been um, a wonderful post-traumatic growth and healing experience for myself and for many um, other community members. We, the reason 
that we started working in the schools was that the teens weren't interested in coming to the community groups that we were offering. The parents were. We worked with a number of adults. Um, I've worked with um, three different uh, groups and co-facilitated um, a mind-body skills group for uh, three different groups throughout the year but the teens were not interested. And um, along with Diane Walk Rogers, we said, let's come up with a different model to bring these skills to the students who really needed it um, after um, the trauma that they experienced. And um, they've been on, the, there's a waiting list now to join the club. And it's been so um, energizing and exciting to help empower um, these students to help themselves and the rest of their community. It was really a joy to join in, since I wasn't allowed to be an observer. I had to be a participant <laughs> in one of the groups. And watching uh, and, and participating in with the young people and seeing how they were responding to the work was so moving. Um, having been trying to bring a lot of resources to the table and seeing resistance at different points, it was so gratifying. And to see how they were applying the work, not just to that trauma, but going forward in their lives in real time, real world experiences. I'm preparing for a test, I used the skills. I'm preparing, I was going to give a speech and I used this and it was really wonderful. Yeah, and that's part of the group that they, they share that every week, how they've used the skills over the week and who they've shared it with. And it's, it is really gratifying to see it spread. I think the fact that you brought it to the school is brilliant, and I do want to hear now from Diane Wolk Rogers, your co-founder of this work, because I think from her perspective as a teacher, uh, it's such a great compliment to you as a parent, and her passion really comes through. Let's hear what she has to say. Following the massacre at my school, um, I experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, and I just couldn't find the calm in myself. So I was thinking, how am I ever going to go back to teaching ever again? And I have a passion for teaching. I love it. I've been teaching for over 30 years. And I noticed um, on my email um, that the Center for Mind-Body Medicine was coming. And um, I thought, oh, great. Well, these, maybe these will give me some tools so I know what to bring back to my students. Um, after experiencing the worst of humanity, I didn't know how to create a trauma-sensitive classroom. It was nothing that I had ever done before. And so, you know, so badly I wanted to bring a year of healing, learning, and love. And when I came to the training and I learned these tools that first took care of me, and I started to notice this wonderful calm in myself that I was finally getting, and um, I wanted to bring that back to my students. So this year, myself, along with a parent, uh, her name's Ellen Fox Snyder, we uh, co-founded the Mind Body Ambassador Club, and we reached out to some of our kids who were most affected. Um, if you know anything about teens, um, they don't want to go to therapy. They don't. They don't. They don't want to go to therapy. They don't want. They, even though we had a wellness center with over a dozen, you know, um, social workers and psychologists, um, that's not what they want. So I basically just went up to some of my students, and these are students who still have shrap metal in them, chronic pain, who were sitting talking to their best friends when they were shot. And I said to them, how amazing you are, because they are, and how they inspired me. You're coming back to school here. You have so much strength. You know, How would you like to learn some of these tools that I learned and help teach it to the rest of our community? And if you know anything about the students from Stoneman Douglas High School, and I'm sure you've seen them, they rose to the occasion and they were like, yes. So what we do is, so since the beginning of the year, every Wednesday, we take a group of about 12 students and we train them in the skills that we're learning here. And they help their peers and they help their parents and they become a part of the club. And after every six weeks, we keep building these cohorts and once a month we meet and we talk about 
how these skills, you know, how, how they're helping their friends and how they're helping their families and how they're helping themselves. And now that the kids have um, written a charter for it, they're like, Ms. Wilk Rogers, this is great. We want to take it to all the schools in Broward County. You know, just like we teach math and science, we need to be teaching mind-body skills because if we look at the world we're living in now, as you know, Dr. Gordon says, everybody's going to experience trauma. And if students don't have that calm in themselves, then that frontal cortex that's going to allow them to listen to the teacher, to sit, to learn, and to remember things, that's not going to be activated. So you can be the best teacher in the world and you can have the best lesson plan, but if that student is sitting there and they're not able to engage their frontal cortex because of all that anxiety, then it's all for naught. And the kids see that it's good, so they're like, Ms. Will Rogers, we're going to take it to all the schools in Broward County, and then we're going to take it to the rest of the country. So that's my mission along with them. And if you know anything about my kids, they're going to accomplish that. So I just started with the sophomores, um, and we were just talking about that. When they go off to college, they're talking about how if they notice you know, in their dorm that a lot of kids get very nervous before you know, finals, that like they tell me now, they sit with their friends now and they do soft belly with them. They have friends that get panicked from loud noises, like when the garbage truck comes and they hear a bump, they sit with them now, their friends, and we talk about that, you know, did you use your skills on yourself or with others? And they teach them how to do some of the soft breathing. Another skill that we teach is to go to safe place because they've learned the didactics behind it and the science behind it too. And they know that when they go to a safe place, um, the, the brain, and we've showed them science behind it, that your brain actually thinks you're in a safe place. So that same type of um, being able to slow down the sympathetic nervous system and engage the brakes, the parasympathetic nervous system, and they have that vocabulary, works. So they talk about that they, when they go to their you know, safe place. And sometimes they come into my class and they go, Ms. Wilker Rogers, I just had a chemistry test. Would you do a soft belly with me? And how great that is, because how do a lot of our youth how do they get that chill? They're doing it through vaping and through drugs. And I talk about that with the kids. I say, you know, this doesn't cost you any money. That same calm feeling that you think, you know, your friends are getting by smoking weed, we can do that with a soft belly. It doesn't cost a dime and there's no side effects. I think one of the most important things of Dr. Gordon's model is that it's um, taking care of yourself first. And that's why the first four days of training is for me to use the tools to take care of myself. And once I have those tools, we come back the second week and then we learn how to apply them for the kids. So it's just meant the world to me to be able to have those tools to help my kids. Diane's passion and commitment to this work is extraordinary. And even more so, her passion for her students. Arthi, I had the pleasure of meeting you a couple of times now, both at the session at the school and in the recent training. What, how did you decide to get involved in this? Yeah, so I was actually in Miss Diane's AP World History class this past year, and I actually moved to Parkland last summer, so I moved here after the shooting. So it's already hard coming to a new school and leaving all the friends, peers, neighbors that I knew for my whole life behind. And when I came here, my only thought is, when I'm meeting these people, I know there's something bothering them and it's hard for me to connect with them when I know there's something bothering them and they're not okay. So my main reason for joining this group that Miss Diane introduced to me was so that I could help my peers and give them a way to heal. So I joined one of the cohorts and I learned these skills and this group really revealed stuff to me that I didn't know about myself, my emotions, my thoughts, what I was actually feeling that sometimes maybe I just put aside and say, let me not think about this. That really opened me up and taught me more about myself. And I wanted to offer this to my friends and neighbors and the new people that I was meeting in the community just so that they could feel what I was feeling about myself. So that's my main goal here. And this year we're starting the Mind Body Ambassador Club and I will be the president of the club and I'm working with a great group of students and we're all very determined to really establish this club at our school and spread it around our community. I have to agree, an incredible group of students yeah. really gives hope for the future. I also found 
I think in participating in the in the training the first time, I didn't know. I mean, in that in that training, I had no idea what was going to come up for me. And you're right; it's just amazing as you apply these tools what what you find out about yourself. And I love you're already helping people. Thank and you. speaking of helping people, Thaddeus, you're not only trying to keep them from drowning; you're using water in a great way to bring peace. Talk about how you came to this mind-body work and what you're doing. Uh, thank you. The, um, the connection I had actually came through the SWIMS Foundation and actually at having meetings with the Drowning Prevention Task Force at the Children's Services Council and it was there that I found out about this training. And I've always been interested, always saw the connection that the water had for healing because that is my journey and path from working with in the NYPD and going through uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and counseling and my access to water and my relationship with the water benefited me. So the conversation about the water being a place of healing, even those who have been traumatized by the water, was something we were already discussing. And then when the tragedy at Stoneman Douglas happened and I found out about this training, I was instantly interested, but at the same time, I was challenged by it. It was when I was uh, asked after going through the initial workshop to sign up, I said yes, no, yes. And it was actually Linda and, and Hannah had an experience at the beach. Mm -hmm. We actually did, prior to the actual training, uh, the uh, PTP training, we, she invited us to go to the beach and have a, an experience. And she practiced mindfulness for us, some of the skills that we were to learn later on, the soft belly breathing, at the beach. And she invited us to then use the environment of the beach, the sand, the water, in the way that we felt comfortable so we could have a, a mind-body connection and find peace in that moment. And it was substantial. The two other participants, actually three of the other participants, were teachers mm -hmm. at Stoneman Douglas. Uh, well, at least... West Glades and Stoneman Douglas. Yes. And I could see the transformation in them that they experienced at the water. So I was, I was set. I was right. completely ready to take it on. But it, it was a, a personal growth moment for me. It actually contributed to my continued healing, which wasn't done yet from 9-11. And when you talk about ACEs and adverse childhood experiences, oh yeah, I had that too. I didn't really understand or appreciate that that was still operating. I didn't understand or appreciate that issues from the police work I was doing and 9-11 were still uh, affecting me today, or at least not to the degree I thought. And then I also had to go through what my um, survivor's guilt, which is a lot of uh, police officers, firefighters, first responders, and veterans it's not only what they've seen and what they did, it's what they didn't do when someone, they were not there. So when Stoneman Douglas, when the tragedy was unfolding and I was watching it on the news, I felt powerless because I couldn't go there to intervene. Wow. And I felt the same way about 9-11 because I wasn't there and I was supposed to be there that day. Huh. I was actually scheduled to be at Ground Zero on 9-11. So the, the training, the experience, healed a lot of things, brought me present to this work in a way that um, working with some youth with the Urban League of Broward County and uh, the Healthy Youth Transition Program, hmm. I brought this training to our first experience meeting a, gr a, 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 a new group of young boys. And I didn't know them, and they didn't know me, and we had a little training experience where we used soft belly breathing we did some mindful walking, and they, the counselors and the life coaches said, we've never seen them behave this way before. But I didn't know that they were in, mm -hmm. in this new behavior. I thought this is, oh, these are good, good kids. <laughs> Normally they're not that calm, peaceful, and controlled. And I was like really so surprised and so satisfied that the, the result of the work was showing up because I was just doing my thing. I didn't think I was doing something so special, actually, at that moment. I, but I found out later that it was substantial for them. Uh, and you know, you raise 
a, a really good point, which is one of the reasons that the Children's Services Council um, ha is working on growing this work and outside of the school system. So the school system's commitment mm -hmm. is incredible, and I'm really looking forward to seeing these clubs uh, happen throughout the county, and I believe Mr. Runcie's commitment is strong to that. But through us, we're trying to bring it outside to the Healthy Youth Transitions programs, to our positive youth development programs, because we want to reinforce those skills and get them out there more generally throughout the county. Right. And, and Linda, you're partnering with us on that. Right. We have a, a strategy that we're continuing to build. Talk about how you've seen this in a lot of different settings, because we do know, sure. and I want to talk more about what we're seeing at Stoneman Douglas in particular, but as I said in the opening, trauma is universal. So some of the healing that we're experiencing really has nothing to do with the shooting that day. Mm -hmm. How is it so, how is it that it unlocks all of these other traumas? Yeah, I think Thaddeus' story about um, how he found it working for himself and sharing it with others because it is about a partnership. It's about really connecting with your own healing, uh, learning the skills on yourself, and then sharing it with others. I think um, in a lot of communities, it's coming in and building those partnerships like we have done here with Broward County, Children's Services Council, um, many students, parents, mental health providers, because it, it gives them a change in their own functioning. They're able to practice. We call them experiments. And that part of self-awareness, really understanding what, what does it do for me? And I can speak from that point. I can share what I've noticed. I can share a little bit of the science. You know, even young children can learn how their amygdala gets hijacked, how fight or flight shows up, and how using movement or breath or meditation, using play, can help them regulate their emotions. So it's really providing life skills, and I think that's where it is about trauma, but it's about improving our lives and helping us connect with ourselves and each other. Yeah, we brought it to of... many places, and um, for many of us at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, it is really important to bring it to the youth. And I think this panel and, and the focus of what you're doing here in Broward County and at your council is really seeing, you know, focuses on children and that children are gonna go home, even young children, definitely teenagers, but even in elementary school, they can go home and teach their, their grandma, their, their brother or sister, their parent, their friend, a skill that they learned. And it's important to go where the kids are because once they get a taste, they make it better. They make it, they, they make it something that's personal to them and share from that place. Yeah, Arthi, have you seen your friends be receptive to it? Yeah, so just by people's stories from the experiences they've had with the mind-body groups, I can see that there's been like a physical change in their body or the way they think or approach things. And that's why mental health is so important because trauma happens to everyone sometime in your life, and it's just about how you cope with it. And we can see that they're getting these skills that help them cope with it, and that's gonna actually help them. As a clinician, it's a really different way of interacting. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some of my folks were a little surprised at first at the participatory nature. Ellen, what was that like for you as you went into it? Well, my first experience in the first training, I saw my facilitator model <clears throat> um, the sharing and what was coming up for her. And she was so authentic that it really gave permission to the rest of the group. And I found, I, I felt very comfortable sharing more because of that. So in that model, um, as a facilitator, I share what, what is coming up for me and what I may be struggling with. Um, and that often gives everyone else in the group, the other students, and as well as the co-facilitator, um, the permission and the comfort level to share what's coming up for them. 
I think some people may be hesitant or concerned because they think it's therapy, group therapy. And that has, you know, for some they're happy with that and others are kind of off-put by yeah. that idea of group therapy. But it's really, it's not. It's group connection, but it's not group therapy, right, That is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's, it's, a, it's training. It's a, an experience you share. Uh, it's beneficial. It could be therapeutic, but not, it's not therapy. And, and once I started to engage in it, and then I, it's something I could do at home by myself or while I'm driving when I'm feeling a little anxious or stressed about traffic, it's, 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 a, it's a skill. And it's a transformative skill that you can then share with other people. So I, I, I appreciate about it is that um, the science, mm -hmm. as Linda mentioned, it told me about my body in ways that I had never really appreciated or understood. So I could just be the better me, the best me I could be. Right. And even as a police officer, if I knew some of this, I could just imagine I could have been better than I was, even though I wasn't too bad. But <laughs> <laughs> and as a swim coach and dealing with people who've had trauma around water, or, or once people come to the water, it doesn't matter if the trauma was at the water. Mm -hmm. If they still have trauma, they could come to the water with that fear and have a reaction to the water in the same fearful way. And to apply some of the breathing techniques with adults, primarily I work with adults when I go to the water now but I used to coach kids as well, but to apply the breathing techniques and mindfulness techniques prior to getting into the water, it's therapeutic, but it's related to training and to do a learning a physical skill, a preparation for a difficult task. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't feel like therapy. It, it, they don't react to it like therapy. So we're standing on a pool deck with the young lifeguards and we're all standing around breathing. And I, it brought a smile to my face when we did it. And this is right after the training. We did it uh, um, last summer, last summer's training. And it brought a smile to my face because everybody was so connected in a way that we had not been connected prior to doing that. Right. And so it was a, and this is in a training environment. This is about going, learning to swim and swimming for fitness. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's training. I, I, I and, say it's training. You know, when we call it psychoeducation, it's not therapy, it's psychoeducation. And that, that is the difference. But I also think that you're talking about a connection. It really is the power of the small group that um, really creates the magic. Um, I think it would be different if you're learning these techniques online or one-on-one. Right. -on -one. Mm -hmm. the, um, the group connection and the group sharing it creates a lot of the, um, the healing, really. One of the things I found so interesting, and I don't know if you experienced it the same way, thought the, the, group, the group exercise or doing it in a group, but being responsible only for yourself was so freeing because normally I'm trying to solve everybody else's problem and I was told do not solve anybody else's problem this is only about you mm -hmm. but at the same time you're witnessing other people finding these insights for themselves which created a bond that was so powerful but you also weren't responsible for them so it was an interesting both bonding and yet individualized experience no judgment no, just we're witnessing this for you and with you. And the breathing together kind of connect, because one of the challenges we face in addition to trauma is that disconnection, I think, that mm -hmm. brings a lot to it. We mm -hmm. get very isolated, you know, mm -hmm. after a traumatic experience. We think that there's something maybe wrong with us or no one else is experiencing what we're experiencing. So coming together in a group and there's a structure to that, there's those ground rules, those principles of this is self-reflective, this is practicing skills, this is working on ourselves in a group, in a circle of other people. So that community to support, and what we hear over and over is the group is what people enjoy. You know, they use the skills, but the group was the catalyst, what launched their healing. Um, this past year, we also worked with peer counseling They've had a program across Broward County. We had a grant to start at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, but we want to move that to other schools. What those students said, 
they enjoyed the small groups. So when we got 10 of them together, because they felt safe, they felt comfortable. Their classroom was a safe place and they shared openly there, but there's 35 students in a classroom. So we did some of the science there, we did some of the experiential exercises, but we got them together and they just talked about life. You know, and that's the other powerful thing to remember. It's just not about one event, it's about our whole lives and how we integrate this at a time and it moves us forward. And that's, I think, part of that post-traumatic growth healing that, you know, that we have witnessed across, you know, here and across the U.S. and internationally as well. I want to pursue that safe space thing because especially yeah. for teenagers, and I mean no disrespect here, teenagers can be mean. <laughs> and so I think it's pretty powerful and I'm wondering how, how you came to see or your friends came to see that as a safe space. Because that would seem to be a hurdle that would yeah. need to be overcome. How do I know that I can trust these other nine people not to take what they learn and be um, mean with it? For you know, teenagers who may be watching today, what would you say about that? Yes, that's absolutely right. Teenagers do tend to feel more vulnerable than other populations when they admit to facing challenges like anxiety or depression because they do get discriminated against for fe having those feelings. Mm -hmm. But when you're going through something as a group, it kind of builds you that bond that there's other people going through this too. I have people to support me, you know? And like Linda said, at the beginning of each group, we establish those ground rules, confidentiality, no one says anything to other people. And I think over time, as you're learning these skills together, you form that bond. And you'll see that in the first week, no one's going to open up completely. But as time goes on, as they learn to trust each other even more, then people start opening up. And that's where you really see that people are connecting and they're feeling more comfortable in the group. And over the year, you never had anybody breach that, right? You now have no. 40, 30, 40, 40 kids yeah. mm -hmm. who have been mm -hmm. through this, and they have honored that commitment. Yeah, because there's a reason why they're joining the club, because they want to heal themselves. So I think it would just be wrong for them to stifle somebody's, somebody else's path to healing. So no one really goes against those rules, no. That's, I think, really important for folks to know, because yeah. that can be a barrier, I think, right. to Definitely. entry. And so understanding that it really has proven to be safe. And it, you have to be vulnerable to some extent exactly. for it to really work. Exactly. Although you can control how much, how vulnerable you are. Mm -hmm. I also try to make that point so that people aren't afraid to come into the group, that it's always within your power to decide right. how much sharing you do. You can learn the exercises without divulging as much until you feel comfortable with it. Yeah, so a lot of people feel vulnerable, but especially after something big like this happens at your school, sometimes you're just not provided the time or the space to kind of get everything out. And I think that's exactly what this club can offer too, is this time and this safe space that they can share their emotions and get through something within a group. So I think that's also really important. That is, you looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, because we, we, we uh, adults and especially law enforcement, veterans, first responders have something to learn from the courage of these yeah. teenagers who are taking on this work because we are a tough group to open up and to be vulnerable and to be able to express ourselves. So I think it's an individual courageous act. So we could frame it that way. It's, it takes courage to face yourself, to, to deal does. with your own fears. But at the other side of it, in the process, and that's why the group experience, that you can feel the results of it in real time, right in the yes. experience. I had the, the good fortune mm -hmm. of being in Dr. Jim Gordon's small group, mm -hmm. and he was the example of okay. courageous vulnerability for me. So all of a sudden I said, okay, I can, and then my example, it, it impacted someone else who said, well, I, I, because you, know, you, you were able to say that here, I can, you know, now I'll share this. And the, my, uh, my efforts right now in Broward County are to start to work with the police chiefs and the fire chiefs of Broward County. And there's actual an opportunity and an invitation. I'm finishing up my certification with the Center for Mind Body Medicine. And the research I was recently doing 
in order to complete my, my, my paper was to look at the, what are the factors and the dynamics within these subcultures of police officers mm -hmm. and firefighters and veterans that there are barriers to accessing health, Ac saying I need help, right. allowing the help to come in and to learning these skills. And I'm really impressed by what I've, by what I've learned, but the, you know, maybe the examples of the teens is something because I was so impressed this past training. I was so touched. I was so moved. I was so uplifted by, by yeah. seeing it. So maybe it's the example of the teens that, w that could make a difference for us, you know, tough adults that, like, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gordon said, he says, we, we, we were taught to, like, we just have to, you know, be tough. And, and that doesn't work because the science tells you that you're going to be affected. It's going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's going to impact you, and it's going to then affect other people. And I know what it looks like when it affected me, and I wasn't at right. my best. I, the look on my face, I know what it looks like. So when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas happened, I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. So, and I, so I am grateful to learn of and be connected to the example of these young people. Mm -hmm. because that is so powerful, and I hope to be able to share that, find a way to share it strategically. We will help you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are committed to that sharing yes. happening and yes. to getting it to the first responders yes. along with the United Way. Right. Um, we have a commitment to the healing in this community, right. and um, we, we will help you with that. And that part of making it very broad and having many facilitators, you know, Thaddeus mentioned um, certification, that the training is to work on yourself, to learn the skills, how to facilitate with others. And then there's ongoing mentorship, supervision provided, and collaboration about making this um, broadly available. It, it needs to be. We need that for health, mental health. This is, again, healing all of us. It, it needs to, to get to all of these, you know, I look at these beautiful faces behind you, Cindy, you know, all these people that um, can learn these tools and techniques and then share it with others too. And Ellen, you're key to, to that. You've now been certified, is that right? Yes, I've gone through certification and um, I'm gonna continue working with the Mind Body Ambassadors Club as well as um, other, um, areas in the community and um, there really is a ripple effect mm -hmm. um, working with the first responders when they learn how to manage their stress and they go home to their families it's going to affect and create more peace and healing in their own families and the same with the mind body ambassadors they go home and share it with their families and friends. And um, in fact, I've had a number of um, family members come to my adult groups because they've learned about it from their children who have That's been great. in the um, groups um, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So it's, everyone is affecting the people in their lives, and it really creates this ripple effect of, of healing. Yeah, I think the people who have been through it are the best ambassadors, although it's difficult to explain. <laughs> As I try to share with my staff yesterday uh, at our all staff meeting, and I'm trying to build some of the techniques into our uh, management meetings right. and into the our all staff meetings, it's like, the, the big training is important, the multi-week and getting that, that group development, but somehow overcoming, I think um, Jim talked about, or Diane, the invitation, that, that it's an invitation to join and share in right. what we have experienced. And um, some are very receptive, some not so much. But yeah, I think also just framing it as an experiment, like you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Just give it a try. You just experiment with it. And I think kind of that invitation, you know, to, to wonder with somebody about wh what has been challenging. I think of, as I've been doing this work over the past 20, 25 years, my own invitation to myself changes. 
you know, there's a few years ago where I was feeling symptoms of burnout, compassion fatigue. So it was again looking at what do I need to do as a as a person. I had two teenagers. I was working full time. I had some very challenging things happen in my own practice with people that I was working with. These skills brought back that energy and hope where I was feeling pretty hopeless. So I think that connection that the skills give in our own lives, and it might change at different times. Sometimes it was just an invitation, I just need to be more present with, you know, either at work with a colleague or a patient or definitely at home with children and, and a spouse. So I think that invitation to ask ourselves, what, what would you like as you're moving into this next part of your life? How could this be helpful? I have something to offer. Would you like to practice? Would you like to experiment with it? Interesting. And yeah. it's not like a magic bullet. It's no. not going to change everything. Although I will say, when I finished the four days, I felt 10 pounds lighter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a pretty good a testimonial. <laughs> of course, when I said right. that, I had a cousin who said, yeah, you do look thinner. And I'm like, no, no, I, I, didn't. <laughs> I, I lost 10 pounds of emotional baggage. Emotional pain, yeah. Uh, that was really valuable. But I do think there are many other corners to explore. And so what does that mean? Like, so I did the, the four days, which is really a compressed version of the, the multi-week. But I, I want to do it again, because I feel like there's so much more to learn, like just right. going through this. So how does that manifest out in the field? What, how do you use it in your practice? Hmm? The, I know the students continue to get together, right? right. But that is, what are you? So uh, um, as um, the, the Director of Community Outreach Engagement for Diversity and Aquatics, I spoke about the experience with the Center for Mind Body Medicine <coughs> at the conference I just, mm -hmm. uh, the convention that was in Miami. And it, it's a, an aquatic convention, but we are talking about it as far as healing from trauma and fears and anxieties. And, and of course, it was the, uh, the convention was here in South Florida. And then I was invited to present at the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives annual training conference, 2,000 people wow. in uh, New Orleans in August. And the topic is combining the water with mindfulness. And also my, my supervisor in, uh, during the training is gonna be co-presenting this with me in New Orleans. And also connecting to, in Baton Rouge mm -hmm. to Tony Braxton the, she's a, a psychologist working with police officers in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we're building on keeping this connection. So I'm gonna use my specialty as the water, and that was my healing path that brought me here to then continue with the Center for Mind Body Medicine. But I'm, I'm using it in, in a way that it makes it uh, approachable and palatable to people in law enforcement. And, and why I think the water does that, because the water is something, it's a, they see it as something fun, yeah. or as a challenge, or as relaxing. You know, so it's not as, uh, it's not just talking about themselves. So I'm just, that's my little uh, uh, special strategic uh, application, and for veterans too. And, it, and we've seen the results. And I, 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 when we presented um, a relaxation, it was, it was mindfulness before I went through the training. But we presented it to the VA, and the Miami VA accepted it as recreational therapy. But it was mindfulness, and now I understand why it was so beneficial, yeah. because it had this mindfulness component before I really fully understood that. Yeah. And it is more than just, I, we had a couple of people who practiced mindfulness right. in the training who all said this was more than just, and I don't want to diminish mindfulness at all, but it seemed that the way this has all been brought together and the connections to the medical and the data in ways that's a little different from right. just. And I think that's an important thing to emphasize is that mind-body skills includes meditation is part of every mind-body skill. It's, it's that foundation, um, that self-awareness. Um, but this also includes, besides mindfulness exercises, guided imagery, drawings for self-expression, a writing exercise, nutrition, group support, includes biofeedback, which 
is basically using technology to get feedback about your autonomic nervous system, about that stress response, to see that a change in your thinking can change your body, that um, group support, you know, this is about self-awareness as well as learning from each other. So the whole toolkit is broader than mindfulness. Which, and I think that's really important because people can kind of pick and choose. There's expressive meditations that are really important. For me, um, they were a little uncomfortable at first, but then I saw the benefit. It helped kind of shake things up and loosen things up. It definitely helped with fatigue, compassion fatigue. It helped with um, sometimes emotions and deep emotions. So there's, there's a lot of choice. There's a lot of variety, um, which I think people really enjoy. And there's connection. We have just a couple minutes left. Any other last minute thoughts you want to share? Um, just that when I was doing two groups um, in the process of being certified and being supervised and being able to connect to the, the larger community of Broward County, adults and youth, I did one in high school and I did one at a, uh, um, the Department of uh, Transportation for Broward, there was a need that they didn't even know they had for this mm -hmm. work. They did not know it right. when we got in the room. They, or maybe a little bit, but not fully. They didn't fully understand the benefit or how much they needed it. Let's say that. They, they appreciated the benefit. That's what's made them curious. But when they really got the benefit of it, they were like, wow, I really needed this. Even though they were not directly connected to what had happened, they were, had that distance, but still there was a need. Well, there is an, and, and as we said at the beginning, that was a huge community trauma that really right. ripples through everybody. It created a yeah. sense of uncertainty and fear all over the county. But we have communities that have been traumatized for years and have been suffering right. from deep trauma and community violence, and they, have, they are not forgotten. Uh, I'm so grateful that the tragedy brought us the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. I would trade not having the trauma in a second, but, but the fact that, that this came to us because of that and now can contribute to greater community healing is a great gift, and I really thank, thank you. you for all that you've done with that to, to bring that to us. Well, we have a lot of gratitude, too, for partnerships, uh, leaders in the community, uh, everyone that's bringing the skills forward and sharing that, so thank you. So as you've heard and seen, the work is ongoing and the journey to healing continues. With the tools provided by the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and the cadre of ever-expanding facilitators, there's hope for generational transformative change that will impact our community moving forward. Over the next few months, we at the CSC and other community partners will be sharing information on how to get involved locally, either as a participant to learn these skills you've heard about today, or eventually to become a facilitator. I want to thank Dr. Jim Gordon, Linda Richmeyer Sear, Ellen Fox Snyder, Arthi Suresh, Thaddeus Gamery, and Diane Wolk Rogers for helping us move along this journey of healing, transforming trauma through self care. I've been your host, Cindy Arenberg Seltzer. For this or any other episode of Future First, Focus on Broward's Children, Go to our website, cscbroward.org, where you can access our YouTube channel, follow us on social media, and remember to join us next time on Future First, Focus on Broward's Children. Mm -hmm.